Hello and welcome back to the Bird Channel, where we talk about whatever I want and I stream on twitch.tv slash Jinzy. We're going to talk about video games today, one in particular, Chaos Legion. And this isn't really relevant to the topic, but can we just talk about covers? This is the European and Japanese cover. This is the North American cover. They always take the cool artistic aesthetics away and just put person looking menacing on the front. What's up with that? Anyway, carry on. An old PlayStation 2 game. I'm going to tell you about this game and then I'm going to ask you a question. Is the title of this video spoiling the question? Maybe. Let's find out. This is the shortest intro I've ever done. Gather around the fire and let me tell you a tale. Chaos Legion is a hack and slash game from early 2003. It's not an original property like many assumed at the time, but based on the first of several novels written by To Ubukata before he became a big deal. You play as Sieg Wahrheit. If you're German, you're rolling your eyes so hard they've probably exited your sockets right now. As Sieg, you control several powerful creatures, known as legions, that help you fight through waves of enemies and bosses. And I do mean waves of enemies. The screen fills up pretty quickly in some areas, but there's barely to no actual lag, which I always found very impressive. Especially because the enemies don't just hang out waiting for you to do something. The game is divided into 13 stages, and during each stage you collect experience when killing or even attacking enemies. Experience you can spend by the end of each stage to empower your legions. You've a choice between seven legions total. Guilt, a melee sword set. Hatred, big melee bruisers. Malice, a set of archers. Arrogance, shielders. Flawed, quick melee attackers. Blasphemy, literally bombs. And Thanatos, the ultimate legion. He's a big dragon-like creature that you get to use during the prologue, and by the end of that prologue, his crest is shattered into nine pieces. Once you've collected all nine pieces, you can summon his egg form, which evolves into a juvenile form, adult form, and perfect form. He's your own personal Digimon. The legions can either be summoned to fight alongside you, or you can charge them for super attacks, while just using Sieg to do damage otherwise. Solo, you can run and do far more damage. Once summoned, legions will only allow you to walk slowly because you're the main character and that's what main characters do. As a team, you attempt to save the world from being utterly destroyed by the antagonist, your former best friend. The music in this game is very good, really sets the tone. It was composed by Hideyuki Fukasawa and he did an excellent job it has a gothic feel to it, which is great because the setting is decidedly gothic too. The game itself has a rather slow start because you don't have many legion options yet, but as the game progresses, you unlock the ability to awaken legions, allowing you to equip their abilities even when you don't have the legions themselves equipped. You also pick up attack, health, and defense bonuses throughout each map, so by the time you're at the end game, Zeke also feels powerful all on his own. The initial Japanese release was deemed a little too easy, so much like Onimusha, the difficulty was cranked up a little for the West. In Dawn of Dreams, that was a problem. It wasn't balanced very well, and enemies became damage sponges at best. For Chaos Legion, however, it was the right call. Easy mode doesn't ask you to use optimal legions to get through the game, you can just use the ones you like. Normal mode poses a little more of a challenge, and so on and so forth. And because you find upgrades so often, you constantly feel like you're progressing at a steady pace without overpowering the content too quickly. Something that happens often if you're allowed to grind experience, for example. So here's a question. How do you feel about the game so far? Would you want to give it a try? Does it sound like a possibly entertaining game, at least? Hold that thought. Write it down somewhere. Now, let me tell you about the rest of the game. The story of Chaos Legion is based on the first novel written by Ubukata. They're unfortunately not available in English, so I can't really tell you if they're any good. But let's just say I hope this game adaptation didn't do it justice, because the game's story is a mess. I'm not sure if the creators of this game assume their audience had already read the book, but I almost feel like they must have. We open with a cinematic that tells us that we bear the darkest glyph that allows us to sacrifice souls to summon Chaos Legion. The camera shows us a red orb that is never otherwise seen in the game, and then we flash to Sieg Wahrheit. Sorry, I mean... Sieg Wahrheit. Bloodied against the wall, and his ex-best friend, Victor Delacroix... Sorry. Victor Delacroix. Pointing a sword at him. We have committed a sin, it seems, 
and Victor is upset about it. Honestly, the dialogue just seems purposefully vague and a lot of it never comes back or it just doesn't make sense. A woman named Sheila has been killed and Victor asks why she was taken from me. The game replying with, the answer lies within. Within what? This game is only a few hours long if you put some speed into it, so I hope you'll excuse me, but I'm going to spoil the end of the game now. Victor thinks Sieg killed Sheila, but actually it was Victor while possessed by an evil entity. So the answer lies within what? Was he supposed to self-reflect about his memory loss regarding the whole event? Why was she taken from me? Why? The answer is within. What? And that was really the impetus I needed to start therapy. It helped a great deal in exercising the evil entity that had possessed me all those years ago. What? Uh, no, that's, that's not a turn of phrase. I was possessed. Victor goes cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs immediately and tells Zeke he can't die yet because he has to suffer through the underworld first. But also he has to follow Victor to come and see the hidden truth of this world, whatever that means. Victor has stolen the Apocrypha of Isaac, and Zeke was sent after him to get it back anyway, so I don't know why Vic went through the trouble of tracking him down. When we run into him again, he started wearing a funky looking mask, and then he breaks our ultimate legion, Thanatos. Then he shows us a vision of Sheila and invites us to join him so we can be liberated of the dark spirit. And then we skip to three years later for some reason. This story is honestly all over the place. But people are just saying words, but the words, they mean nothing. We learn that Victor attacked a city, disappearing the population and scribbling an edgy message down in blood. I am indeed the punishment for your sins. I'm here to purify the three worlds. Because if he isn't edgy, what is the point? Between chapters, you'll also get little intro voiceovers, and those have the weirdest pauses. Listen to this. A man tormented by the sin of his past encountered a girl who had lost everything. Not a moment of rest was allowed to Zeke and Arcia. Countless starving fangs and ferocious claws are drawing near. Blades, bullets, the girl leaves the injured man behind to seek revenge. She aims the silver gun. She pulls the trigger. With little reservation for the sake. That's a comma, not a period. And even if it was a period, what was that? Anyway, Sieg eventually meets a woman, Arcia. She's a maiden of the silver, fighting the monsters that have spawned everywhere too. Apparently her family's dead now and she was scouting for the order to find Victor. She decides to follow Sieg and together they find one of the three glyphs. Victor takes the glyph, which is apparently important, and Sieg knows why, but we don't. We also find out that Victor wants to keep Sieg around to sacrifice eventually. During the next cutscene we get, well, let me just, I'll just play it for you. The three sacred glyphs, they are the forbidden ancient symbols which will open the gateway of chaos and lead us to the red moon. When they meet, the three glyphs will release the spirit of purification, allowing the three worlds to reunite once again. If that sounded like word salad, then we're on the same page. I'm sure this would not sound like word salad if you've read the novel this game was based on, but I haven't done that, nor could any English speaker read it if they wanted to. The game just doesn't care. It's trying to pump the entire story of the first novel out in the span of a few cutscenes, and it's just not working. Let me spoil what actually happened so it might make a little more sense. The order that both Zeke and Victor are a part of have monopolized the use of legions, as described in the Apocrypha of Isaac. They banned the book in order to keep others from using the knowledge inside. One very powerful legion was Azrael. No, that's actually his name, I promise. He was imprisoned behind a seal that the order broke in order to tame him, but Azrael was too powerful, and Victor was meant to seal him up again. Before he could do so, Azrael attempted to possess Zeke and Victor's lady friend, Sheila. Victor jumps in front and is possessed instead, turning his sword on Zeke, but then Sheila jumps in front of Zeke and dies in his stead. 
Zeke rushes to her side, grabbing the bloody blade, and at that moment, Victor snaps out of it, only seeing Sheila dead and Zeke holding a bloodied sword. He assumes Zeke was responsible, and Zeke does not correct him. Distraught, Victor steals the Apocrypha of Isaac, finds out about the Order's stranglehold on legions, and decides he wants to purge all three worlds. Earth, heaven, and hell, basically. So they can be merged, and everyone can live forever in a strange, mixed landscape. His end goal in that respect is a little vague. Bottom line is he wants to be with Sheila, who is now part of Azrael because she died in his room, I guess, which means he has to release Azrael once more to start the purification of Apocalypse. Yeah, even having played the game, there's just a lot of loose ends. The silliest thing is that throughout the game, Sieg makes it seem like he really did kill Sheila. He knows he didn't, he was there. Maybe the book explains this, but the game certainly doesn't. He even tells Victor that it's not him talking, it's just the darkness that possessed him. Hell, by the end of the game, when the truth is revealed to Victor, and he yeets himself off the platform to awaken Azrael himself, Sieg says he knew this would happen. So he intentionally didn't tell Victor because he knew he'd do what he just did, except he was already doing that without being told what was going on, so I don't see how it matters. Anyway, Sieg has visions of Sheila asking him why he killed her. He keeps talking about his terrible sin he has to atone for, which turns out to just be his inability to save Sheila. Bit odd to make that your terrible sin, but sure. Victor eventually finds all three glyphs needed to release Azrael, and now all he needs to do is sacrifice Zeke. At one point, Arcia storms in and calls Victor pathetic, and it's just... it's just funny, honestly. No! Don't make it any worse. You're so pathetic. Victor then uses the force to make Arcia point her own gun at her head, and it fires, but don't worry, it turns out that he released his power for just a moment, causing Arcia to switch the gun to her other hand, I guess? So she could shoot her arm. Or maybe she became Elastigirl momentarily, so she could shoot her arm from an angle? <laughs> Arcia! Arcia? What? What? Either way, Zeke defeats Victor, but he teleports and tries to kill Zeke anyway. Arcia jumps in front, triggering a memory for Victor, because this is also what Sheila did to protect Zeke from possessed Victor's blade. Distraught, Victor now sacrifices himself to unleash Azrael anyway, because he still thinks it's a dope plan. We defeat Azrael, who spawns a demon Sheila, who we also defeat, and then we finally see Sheila and Victor in heaven, because I guess he was right and this was a very good and cool idea. Sheila does not seem in the least bothered by Victor's previous mass murdery antics. Our final scene is Arcia leaving with Zeke and giving us the creepiest smile so far. The end. This story was a whole mess. Every cutscene put together takes about half an hour, and in that time they're trying to tell you what happened in 355 pages worth of light novel. And a good amount of the cutscenes are just flashbacks and retreads of things we've already seen. Or these sorts of things. I promise. The characters remain extremely bland stereotypes because we really don't know anything about them bar the standard tragic standoff between Zieg and Victor. I really don't know anything about Zieg. Arcia is sad because her brother was killed by Discount Sephiroth. No, I mean, honestly, just look at this. I don't know what's happened between you and Delacroix. Every so often we see Sheila in a short flashback as this angelic person who's nothing but good and pure and kind and, and that's it. How are we supposed to feel a connection to characters we barely know? You'd think an adaptation of a novel would want to do the story justice, 
Otherwise, what's the point of adapting a novel? Instead, the story is probably the worst part of the game. Although, gameplay-wise, you'll figure out what does and doesn't work quickly enough, pushing you into very similar fight patterns over and over again. Not to mention weird little quirks like this boss in the forest zone that you initially run through with Arcia. You can eventually revisit worlds, which is great! They even adjust their monster population eventually. This particular stage, however, has a boss that you can't kill with Seek, just Arcia. So you can get all the way over here with Seek, and then stand there like a jackass until you quit back into the intermission menu. And then there's Zeke's occasional floaty animations, music abruptly cutting off, weird cuts in general, the PC port having every conceivable bug under the sun, and oh man, don't get me started on the voice acting. So, how do you feel about the game now? If you were interested in playing before, are you still? Do you think I like this game? I'll give you a minute. I love this game. This was one of my favorite games as a kid, and I still love it. Despite all the flaws I've just listed, despite the story being hot flaming garbage, I still love this game. But be honest, after I discussed all the downside to this game, you probably thought this game was bad, especially after going in depth about the story. This video was partially an excuse to talk about Chaos Legion a bit, but I also thought it was the perfect example of reviews affecting our view on video games in general. Chaos Legion, objectively, isn't a very good game. There's a lot wrong with it, but I also wouldn't call it a very bad game. When you look at the reviews it got at the time, though, you'll find 1-star reviews, 2-star reviews, 4.5s out of 10s, 37 out of 100. At best, most reviews thought it was just mediocre, at worst, they thought it was the biggest pile of garbage since unsliced bread. But I didn't know that as a kid. I read a single game magazine and it did not feature Chaos Legion, or if it did, I never found it. So. I picked up the game and had a great time with it. And then I grew up. I learned that this game was very bad, actually. Everyone thought so. It must be true. But I remember that I liked it, so... Did I just not recognize bad games? Or was it something else? I decided to replay Chaos Legion as an adult to see if I just misremembered, perhaps. But there was one big difference this time. I was told the game was bad. I went into the game with a voice in the back of my head reminding me of this indisputable fact. This game is bad. So instead of just playing the game and enjoying it as before, without realizing it, I started looking for the bad parts that justified the bad reviews. All the parts I liked were still there. I still liked them. But the confirmation bias I'd built up after reading so many scathing comments about this game kind of ruined the experience for me anyway. Reviews can often be helpful, of course, in trying to decide whether you want to spend your money on a game or not. The problem we face now that we didn't as often in the past is the lack of demos. Remember when you'd buy a game magazine and it'd come with a demo disc containing trial versions of a bunch of upcoming games? Those sorts of things aren't around very often anymore. Very rarely will games even have a demo version at all these days, and when they do, you can't fully trust them still on account of the constant updates in the always online world. Developers don't have to ship out anything permanent, they can just patch their game if it's broken. Better than to rely on reviewers who have played a good chunk of the game already. Except even then, you're sometimes going to get screwed over because developers have been adding things like microtransactions after reviews have gone out already. So in the end, whatever gets the most traction is generally what paints the picture for the majority of potential buyers. I still haven't played Cyberpunk 2077, even though I really want to. I'm waiting for the very final patches, for them to say it's truly and finally done, even though plenty of my Twitch viewers have already told me that the game is fine now. It runs fine. There are still some bugs, but nothing game-breaking. I could enjoy myself right now, but I can't push myself to do it because of all the bad I've heard since its release. Because I know in my heart that if I did try the game at this moment in time, I'd start looking for the bad. And that's no fun for anyone. And that's another point, actually. On re-watching my Shadow Hearts videos, I noticed that I didn't convey quite as well why I love the games. Instead, talking about the things that bothered me, especially in the later entries. 
Shadow Hearts is one of my favorite game series of all time, and I wanted other people to enjoy it the way I did too. But positivity isn't as easy to make entertaining as criticism is. Script Gen Z interrupting for a moment. While writing this script, my program did not recognize positivity as an existing word. And if that's not indicative of today's gaming circles, I don't know what is. Outrage sells, anger sells, negativity gets the clicks. The internet knows that, and so it hones in on that. The majority of people would sooner click on a title like Worst Game in the History of Ever than they would Best Game in the History of Ever. Sometimes because they want to see the train wreck, other times because it's funny to see people make fun of something bad. Because of that, a lot of reviews have a habit of losing nuance in favor of getting to the point, the funny haha -ha point. Much like what happened in the Shadow Hearts videos. People very often don't want to say a game is just fine. It's either God's gift to humanity sent from the heavens above, or it's the worst thing in the history of life, the universe, and everything. There's rarely an in-between, because if there is an in-between, it's not worth making content about. This happens to highly anticipated games often enough. A lot of the big releases generate a lot of hype, and when the game doesn't quite live up to everyone's expectations, it can't just be an okay game, it has to be bad. Reviews are a big part of this problem, as mentioned. However, the online gaming community has as much to do with this as anything else. Even when a game is considered good by the majority of people, there will be a set of people on the internet that have created the right way to play. The Souls community is the perfect example of this. You're not really playing a Souls game if you're using summons. You're cheating if you use magic. You can't reload the game to get a better outcome. That's safe scumming. You have to build a certain amount of vigor or you're building your character wrong and you'll get one shot by every high-end boss. There is no right way to play a game, of course, save for whatever way you feel is fun. But when you read these comments often enough, you start to feel a little guilty at times. Yeah, I'm using a summon, but just for this boss, because it's just unfair, really. No one could blame me. Yeah, I'm playing on easy mode, but I, I just want to get a feel for the game. I'll play on hard mode afterwards, of course. And sure, you can say you don't care what people say. Perhaps a lot of people don't. But do you remember the Wolfenstein The New Order easy setting? They thought they were being extremely cool when they named their difficulties. The hardest being Uba, uh, then I am Death Incarnate, followed by Bring Em On and uh, Don't Hurt Me, the easiest setting. Can I play Daddy? Accompanied by a picture of the main character in a baby outfit. The setting's description reads, very easy difficulty setting for the spineless game. Why even put that difficulty in there at that point? What does that signal? Were they that desperate to insult people just looking to have fun with a game? Video games should not be torture. Unless you're into that, of course, I'm not going to yuck your yum, but in that case, it's not torture for you. We play games to relax, to follow a good story, to have a good time in general. Bashing your head against the wall because you feel like the internet won't think you're cool if you don't is lunacy. But we do it anyway. And a lot of the times, that makes us resent the game eventually. The Undertale community is another notorious version of this where if you don't make the correct decision at the start of the game, you'll invoke the wrath of the masses immediately. And don't even get me started on the set of people who feel you haven't really finished the game unless you have every achievement. Supergiant actually had a comment on this exact thing. There is no achievement for 32 heat in Hades and that's on purpose. For those who haven't played the game, Hades is a roguelike where you can increase the difficulty of the game through heat. For example, you can give the first boss some extra abilities and this will add one heat. If you give the next boss extra abilities too, it will add another two heat for a total of three and so on. 16 heat is the hardest achievement in the game as it requires you to make your enemies a lot stronger and yourself a lot weaker. But it's not the hardest thing you can do in the game. You could play on Hell Mode, an extra difficult mode, and turn up the heat all the way to 64. Quite a feat if you can pull it off, but there's no achievement for it. Supergiant had this to say on the matter. 32 clears are beyond the ability of many players, and in general, we're not big on achievements that are extraordinarily difficult even for the skillful, 
invested players. This is just part of our design philosophy when it comes to achievements, and of course it's okay to disagree with it. I'm just explaining the reason for the omission. As a more extreme example, we could have had clear the game on 50 heat with each weapon, something that is theoretically possible, but almost no one would be able to do that. And if you're someone who enjoys earning achievements, what might happen is you would repeatedly try to get that achievement, then eventually quit the game in frustration. We would much rather you leave this game happy than angry. The thing about achievements is they can create a certain pressure to play a game in a certain way, and we don't want our achievement design to have an oversized influence on players' experience. The internet is wonderful in a lot of ways. After all, I get to share this video with you. But it's also a deluge of information, and every facet of the social media spectrum wants a piece of you. The best way to get that piece of you is to yell about how bad something is, even more so if you actually liked that thing, because you might want to come in and defend it. Which means that, on average, the internet will reinforce your dislikes a lot more than your likes. But it also makes us, as a whole, more critical than we need to be. Are there objectively bad games? Yes, E.T. was terrible. But just because a game has flaws, that doesn't mean it doesn't deserve a chance. All of my favorite games have problems. Yours did too, I guarantee it. And yet, we enjoy them. Because first and foremost, we gave them a chance. There are many more reasons games have changed the way they have over the years, and perhaps we'll talk about that some other time. But for now, stop looking for things to dislike about the games you play. Reviews are helpful, but they should only ever be a guideline in terms of what you're buying. Once you have the game, once you're playing it, give it a fair chance. Ignore what everyone thinks is the correct way to play, and I promise you'll enjoy yourself more. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to play The Bouncer, another personal favorite the critics didn't like, where you play as Sora in the darkest timeline until another tale finds us.